welcome to Spear Medical Education. Uh, I'm Eric and today we're going to be looking at enhanced chest assessment skills. So here we're looking at uh, your your B, your breathing assessment or your R assessment if you're using uh, March. And what we're looking for really here is um, this is aimed at providers for, for that, that can manage, sorry, attention pneumothorax, an open pneumothorax or perform a surgical or needle cricothyroidotomy. So um, the, the aim of this assessment is to be able to try and find or predict uh, the, the, the sort of pathology that would, that would require these interventions to be carried out in the first place. Um, if you can't carry out these interventions, there's still some value in understanding it because if you can identify the problems and understand the event interventions required, then you know uh, exactly what it is and why you're referring this patient to the next level of care or getting that next level of care to you. But like I said, primarily it's, it's aimed at your paramedics, your docs that can that can deliver these sorts of interventions to patients. So, just as a reminder again, like I said, this is your your B assessment in your CABCDE assessment, or uh, if you're using March, it's under your R assessment. So we're looking specifically at uh, breathing. So uh, we use the uh, we use the sort of flaps twelve system to uh, to remind us what to do, uh, and and so we don't miss anything. So it's part of our structured systematic approach. And we ins it ensures that if we don't miss any of these steps, uh, then we're not going to actually uh, miss any potential sort of reversible life-threatening uh, condition that we can do something about. So FLAPS is concerned uh, primarily with the assessment of the patient's chest. And then 12 is um, concerned primarily, <coughs> primarily with the assessment of the, uh, the patient's neck. Now, we're looking at the neck. I mean, yes, for, for wounds and everything, um, but actually... The neck assessment also gives us some idea of what's going on inside the patient's chest too, which is why it's included in this assessment. So we'll move on to the uh, the first step of the assessment then, which is flaps. So if we look first of all at uh, feel, so this is obviously looking at the chest, getting hands on the chest uh, ourselves, and you're feeling for any crepitus, so that sort of air or sort of bone uh, interacting within the uh, within the chest wall. We're looking for any surgical emphysema, so it's that bubble, that, that sort of bubbling, that rice crispy bubbling that's, um, that's sort of underneath the, the surface of the skin that suggests that there's been some, uh, some damage on the, uh, the sort of surface lining of the, uh, of the lung and air is able to escape into the surrounding tissues. Um, and then we're looking as well, uh, sorry, we're feeling as well, uh, do we have equal chest expansion? So is both sides of the chest uh, sort of rising at the same time? We can, we can do that by putting our hands, sort of each hand on each side of the chest. And as they breathe, we're looking for a good symmetrical rise and fall of the hand. Um, we can also look for things like paradoxical chest movement at the moment. So where a piece of uh, sort of rib is moving paradoxically, so independently to the rest of the chest wall. Um, and uh, same again, we can feel for any sort of bruising or um, swelling, sorry, we can feel for any sort of swelling uh, that's going on with the chest. So, next we're going to look at, ooh, wrong one, uh, next we're going to have a look at, look, funnily enough, so we felt, now we're going to have a look, so we're having a look at the patient's chest and we're looking for um, any bruising, bleeding, sort of deformity, and remembering as well that we need to look at the um, the back and the sides of the chest too. Now I've put um, this diagram on here. Um, this is sort of another poorly drawn picture from me, um, just here. And this is actually stood at the uh, the foot end of the patient, so if the patient's on a bed or a stretcher or anything like that. You can get down low, squat down at the foot end of the stretcher, and actually this is where you'll see uh, most evidently. Uh, paradoxical chest movement. So if you can see the green arrows represent equal chest expansion and the red arrows um, represent sort of asymmetrical in expansion. So whilst one side of the chest is rising normally, the other one isn't rising as well. And that can give us our first indication that um, that something's going on. And same again, we can see, uh, we can we will be able to see at this stage any paradoxical chest movement, um, that hyper expansion and also we're looking for uh, any bruising, bleeding, um, any obvious wounds or anything like that that we might be able to do something with. So that's look. We then move on to auscultate. So obviously this is where we're using our stethoscope and uh, we're going to auscultate, at least on the front of the chest, on just these uh, landmarks. So just remembering that we need to go from sort of one side to the other, then one side to the other, and then one side to the other. 
And the reason we're doing that is actually we're comparing potentially um, the good side of the chest to the bad side of the chest, or at least just being able to compare one side of the chest to the other to make um, it more obvious that there's a problem with one side of the chest that's not affecting the other. And what we're listening for here is um, any sort of normal, um, or well, we're listening for normal breath sounds, and if not, are they diminished or, or are they absent entirely? So do we have sort of like good sort of audible air entry here, but poor en poor air entry here, or absent air entry here, good air entry here, poor air entry, good air entry, poor air entry, for example, that would lead us to think that there's obviously something going on with the, uh, the left side of the patient's chest. Um, and is there any added or abnormal sounds? Now, this isn't a medical chest auscultation, so we're not listening for sort of wheezes, creps, crackles, all that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, there, are, so there, are, there are sort of things like blast lung where you might actually start hearing that sort of edema, that, that sort of fluid on the lung. So you might hear some, some added or abnormal breath sounds. But at this stage, we're just noting that there is ad added or abnormal breath sounds because it's not a medical patient assessment. So we're not, we're not sort of treating asthmas or anything like that, pro pro probably, at this stage. So after we've auscultated, uh, we're then going to percuss, percuss the patient, patient's chest. Get my words out. So when we're percussing the patient's chest, it's exactly the same sort of uh, comparing one side to the other or good to bad over here, just like we did when we were auscultating. And we're listening for hyper resonance. So that would be air, uh, indicating air in the chest <clears throat> or hypo resonance, which would suggest fluid on that side of the chest. Now, the only way you're ever going to know what is hyper and hypo resonant is um, by by sort of performing this on a lot of normal chests. When you start to get used to what a normal sort of percussion note sounds like, you're more likely to pick up abnormal sort of percussion notes. And so, again, if you're comparing one side of the chest to the other, then hopefully you'll hear a tone difference between the two anyway, if there is something going on. Now, one thing to note with percussion is uh, in our environment, uh, it's obviously really loud uh, in the pre-hospital environment. So we're not necessarily going to be able to hear this. If you've got fire service sort of cutting around you, for example, if um, there's engines running, there's this sort of uh, commotion going off outside the vehicle and things like that, then you're not necessarily going to hear um, the, the, the sort of subtle changes in a percussion note, but it is still a good skill to have and to practice, but just be aware that you might not be able to use it in all, you know in the sort of in all environments that we find ourselves working in but if you've not seen a percussion technique before I've demonstrated one I've demonstrated one here on this little video uh, just on a table but just so you can sort of see the technique but I'm sure if you look on YouTube there'll be uh, plenty of other other examples of, of actually performing it on a patient's chest and you can see there in reality, the flat, the whole of that that sort of underside of the finger would be flat against the uh, the patient's chest because it'd be sort of contouring with their chest. It's a bit harder on a table because I'm not particularly flexible, but this part of the of my finger would be in contact with the patient's chest in between the ribs. So you're not doing it on the ribs; you're doing it in the intercostal space between the ribs. And I'm tapping on uh, the bridge of the finger here, and I'm listening for a change in sort of percussive note. So that's percussion. Like I said, it can be really useful, but we need to be realistic with the environment that we find ourselves working in that, that it might not, we might not be able to hear anything. So after we've percussed, at the end of flaps is search. So I've drawn little cubes here just to remind you that our patients aren't 2D. So they're not squares, they're cubes. So we're searching for any anything we've missed at this stage, any injuries we've missed. And it's just that mental note to remember we're not just looking at the front side of the chest. We need to get our hands on that chest, under the arm, uh, up into the armpits, and then where we where we can roll the patient and examine uh, the back for any further injuries uh, that we've missed. So that's search. And like I said, just be really, really thorough. You can't be thorough enough, um, particularly stab wounds when uh, sort of uh, skin folds back into place. If the patient's had their arms up uh, sort of towards the head when they've been stabbed then they've sort of brought their arms down after they've been stabbed, it can conceal the injuries. So you need to be thorough, stretch the skin, uh, and try and find any anything that we might have missed. <clears throat> Once we've done our search, we're then going to look at um, 12. So remember, and this is where we're sort of focused on the neck, but even though we're looking at the neck, it's actually primarily telling us what's going on in the uh, in the patient's chest. So the first thing we look at is the trachea. Now, you've probably heard of tracheal deviation before, so that's where uh, the trachea, so here, your windpipe, starts to move to the left or to the right, and it's generally... Um, that means it's it's sort of moving the opposite direction to where the problem is. So if it's moving to the patient's right, it generally means there's a problem on the left side of the chest that's causing that deviation. 
Now, it's most evident here at the sternal notch, so that is just here. So at the point where the trachea goes into the sternum, the, uh, the sort of lower end of it, you'll start to see that moving before anything else because that's closest to the chest, to the mediastinum, where, where this movement's going on. Um, so all we're looking for is, is it central or is it moving to, to the left or to the right? Now, if we found diminished breath sounds on one side of the chest and hyper resonance on one side of the chest during our flaps assessment, um, looking at the trachea and then seeing that the trachea is moving to the right would you know just further reinforce that sort of belief that um that, that you know the clinical picture that there's something going on in the left side of the chest that we're probably going to have to do something about at this stage now i've put here the deviation is a pre-terminal sign it is it's um so we, we, when we're seeing this we are starting to expect uh that the patient's going to go off on as they are um at sort of risk of going into cardiac arrest quite quite rapidly um hopefully you've seen lots of other signs of attention pneumothorax before you've seen the trachea moving um such as you know your air hunger uh, blood pressure in their boots, that um, poor chest expansion, potentially hyper resonance in that side of the chest, etc. Before you've before the the um, the trachea has even had chance to start moving off to one side, but this is our last chance to catch it. If we've missed all those other signs that would be going on with a patient, this is our last chance to go. Ah, okay, that explains why you know the rest been at sixty breaths a minute and um, that side of the chest isn't moving properly because obviously the the trachea is moving. So this is bad and we need to do something about it. So it is a pre-terminal sign and hopefully you've picked up on it sort of before now, fingers crossed. But if not, it's another opportunity to, to catch the diagnosis and do something about it. So we then look at wounds. So 12 W, we're looking at wounds. And this is looking at wounds to the neck. So um, we're looking at uh, things like, you know, for lacerations and bruising, but actually whilst a, we're, not, we're not talking about putting a bandage on a tiny little scratch on somebody's neck at this stage obviously if it was a catastrophic sort of bleed to the neck we would have dealt with that under catastrophic bleed already but when we say wounds on our neck assessment we're not talking about little scratches and scrapes and things like that we're actually um, looking for for sort of lots of bruising around the neck or any sort of suggestion of direct trauma to the larynx that would um, suggest that there's going to there either is or there is the potential of significant airway swelling if there is, then we're going to start anticipating um, that airway compromise. So we're anticipating that this problem that we're seeing here is going to put this patient at a high risk of, of a gradually deteriorating airway um, that might need managing later on down the line. So we're looking for bruising, we're looking for bleeding, we're looking for any swelling. And you can look at C-spine at this stage if you haven't thought about it already. Um, but if you do look at our video on uh, the trauma primary survey, uh, I'll go into more detail there as to, to why we need to not be letting this C-spine sort of piece drive absolutely everything that we do with this patient to the detriment of other stuff. But I'm not going to steal my thunder from that video. You can have a watch on the uh, on the the other sort of on, on the rest of the channel. Uh, we will talk about some of the statistics around C-spine injuries and why it's not you know we, we shouldn't be letting that drive the uh, the main effort of the patient. This patient's sort of examination and treatment, but you can consider it at this stage anyway. So after we've looked for wounds, it's another chance to look for emphysema. So we've already, uh, when we were feeling the chest, we were feeling for emphysema. So that's get that air trapped under the tissue. Um, now, when we're looking at the neck, uh, we're, we're doing the same thing. We're just looking at the neck. And actually, I've had patients where it sort of come up into the, um, to the lower parts of the face as well and around the, uh, the sort of mandibular area and up into the cheeks. Um, so it's quite common to see it around the, around the clavicles, up into the sides of the neck, and then the lower parts of the face. And again, that's giving us a really good barn door clue that there is um, sort of traumatic insult to the surface uh, lining of the lung and we've got air sort of escaping into the, uh, the surrounding tissues. So, ooh, wrong one again. So next is left for larynx. So L, so we're looking at larynx. So we're looking for stability in crepitus. So if there is crepitus there, that's good. So there should be a little bit of a click when you grab hold of the larynx. I'll just colour that in red actually because it's a bit hard to see in yellow. So when you grab hold of the patient's larynx and you just give it a sort of push down a little bit and give it a little sort of nudge side to side, there should be a bit of a click there. If there isn't, or oh, it's quite quite spongy when you press on it, that suggests that there's uh, fluid starting to develop uh, around the larynx. So again, that'd be that sort of swelling, that anticipating uh, future airway compromise. We can also, uh, there's other sort of clues that we've got that this sort of laryngeal sort of disruption going on and that's um, their voice sounds. So um, have they got a high pitched voice or are they are they not able to speak at all because of the uh, the swelling that's going on here? Um, like I said, is there crepitus there? Is it stable? And is it free from obvious damage or swelling? 
If the answer to, to sort of these questions, um, any of these questions is no, then we're going to just use that as, again as a tool to anticipate an insidious airway compromise, so an airway problem that's got the potential to develop and has got the potential for us to um, to need to do some advanced sort of um, potentially front of neck interventions later on down the line with this patient. We then got onto V for veins. So we're looking here at um, jugular venous, yeah, to get my words out, jugular venous distensions. That's uh, these sort of jugular veins that they, they sort of look like this. They, they end up really big, quite, so, you know, I've, I've seen them as sort of wide as your thumb, big distended neck veins. Um, now, if the patient's hypovolemic, so if they've lost lots of blood, you, you're normally not going to see it. But if, so if we're talking about the polytrauma patient, they've got lots of chest injuries going on, uh, but they've lost a lot of blood as well, then you might not see this even, you know, even if the, the patient's got pathology that would normally create it, just because there's not a lot of sort of blood left in the body to do it. But if you do see it, um, it can suggest that there's an obstruction within the, in the chest cavity, within the thoracic cavity, such as either a tension pneumothorax uh, or a cardiac tamponade. So again, it's just building that picture up of what could be going on with, uh, with your patient. And then finally, oh, there we go, evaluate. So this is putting um, everything together. So this is uh, putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. And uh, at this stage, we're sort of thinking if we've got uh, that sort of you know poor, poor chest movement, um, that, that reduced air entry, that hypo or hypo resonance, what is it? What could it be? Is it something that we need to treat? So when we're evaluating, we've talked about this before on one of my other YouTube videos uh, where we discuss um, chest injuries in general. Um, and types of traumatic chest injuries. But this uh, pneumonic blattum FC, it's a blast lung airway compromise, tension pneumothorax, open pneumothorax, massive hemothorax, and flail chest segments. If we've done our um, FLAPS 12 assessment correctly, then we should, be able, should have been able to identify any of these occurring and then obviously treat them accordingly. So evaluate is just where you stitch everything together, everything you found so far in your chest assessment and, and sort of come up with a, uh, a working diagnosis. So an example of what that might look like is we've got good air entry denoted by the green arrows, uh, sorry, good sort of chest expansion denoted by the green arrows on this side of the chest. And on the patient's left side of the chest, uh, we can see bruising developing. We've got reduced air entry sort of going backwards and forwards. Um, we've got, uh, if I move these sort of, oh, wrong one. Uh, if I move these, we've got, uh, sort of good air entry. Oh, I've messed that up. Let's just use make some new ticks. So if I'm auscultating the chest, I've got good air entry on this side, and I've got poor air entry on this side of the chest. Okay, when we're auscultating. Um, so we've had a listen to the chest. Uh, we've got that bruising. We've got that poor chest movement on one side. We've got reduced air entry on that side. If we were to put uh, percuss it, we find hypo resonance on that side of the chest. Uh, all suggestive that there's fluid, in this case, most likely blood in the chest. So I've also gave you a bit of um, sort of tracheal deviation there as well. So the trachea is deviating away from the injured side of the chest. So this is all signs that the, the chest is just filling with blood and like, you know, this patient's obviously in a really poorly way and they need definitive surgical treatment. So we need to be evacuating them really, really quickly. So apologize, a bit of a longer video than normal, but I wanted to go through this in, in some detail with, with my usual little IT, IT hiccups along the way. Uh, I hope you found it useful. Um, the This does tie into the primary survey video, which is also on the channel. I encourage you to have a look at that, uh, where we sort of stitch all this together within a primary survey. But as you can see, chest assessments is quite a long topic just on its own. So I wanted to do a separate video on this one. Thank you very much for watching. If you've uh, enjoyed this, found it helpful, please give us a like and subscribe. It really, really helps us out and helps us sort of make more content. And if, you've, if you're on any sort of student paramedic forums, Facebook groups or anything like that, uh, or any other sort of uh, student sort of medical groups, uh, please feel free to share the channel. We are going to be producing more and more content. Thank you.